Hey everyone, Deepak Sai Baba here. This is the Three Question Show. Thank you so much for all the subscriptions and encouragement and comments. Keep them coming. Today we have Ben White, who's the director of Titus Talent Strategies. He lives in Wisconsin in the United States. He lives in Milwaukee. Ben leads a high-performing team of recruiters who are passionate about finding for their clients talent they did not know was available. Ben has more than 10 years of corporate experience. So welcome, Ben. Would you like to say a few words? Yeah. So um, I live just west of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. uh, about 20 minutes west. I And I'm in the talent acquisition space. So I work for Titus Talent Strategies. We are a talent management firm, and I manage um, a large team of recruiters. And so I do a lot of work with different clients, mostly the Midwest, but all across the United States, and some work even internationally. Um, and we focus on passive candidate recruitment. Okay. So we don't post anything online. It's 100% a client says, this is what we're looking for. And then we go out and we find people who typically are not looking for new work, but are top 25% performers. Um, and we tell them the story of our clients, why they're appealing, why they should entertain the opportunity, and then we engage them. And that's kind of a little bit about, about me. Wow. I think that's really amazing, Ben. You know, um, I always wonder, there are companies that do that, what you just said, connecting clients to existing top performers. I think that's like really uh, unique. Uh, but other than that, is there anything else that you, you do that probably stands out? There's a bunch of other things we do that's really unique too. I think, I think my company is incredibly unique. Um, but we also use predictive index. So we use an assessment tool and we do, we get personalities, um, like a personality assessment. Mm -hmm. And then we, we also get that for people at the organization. So mm -hmm. we can find these kind of alignments. So you take top performers at a role, like say you have, hey, so I'll talk to a hiring manager. Maybe they're hiring a software engineer. I'll say, why don't you have your three best software engineers take this assessment mm -hmm. and then we'll make kind of like a, an ideal profile. And oh, then in addition yeah. to going and finding top performing people, we have them take the assessment and you can almost clone from a, you know, a personality and behavioral perspective, your top performers. And then we also do cognitive assessment. And then we also talk about value alignment. We talk about, you know, we talk to our clients and say, you know, what are your values? What drives you? What are the values you live? as an organization. And then we, we talk to the candidates and go, what's important to you from a value perspective. Mm -hmm. And so we try to find, we call it head, heart, briefcase. We, we use head, we use predictive index. So we use these, you know, analytical tools to make sure it's a match, both from a personality perspective and cognitively. Then we do heart. We, we talk about, Hey, are you a match um, from your value perspective? Is there strong value alignment? Cause that's incredibly important long-term and then briefcase. And that's what have you done? What have you accomplished? What are your most significant career accomplishments? Um, and are those the things that our client needs you to accomplish? And we make sure there's alignment there. So it's a very thorough process. It's very in-depth. Um, and not to go on too much about Titus, but that's why we guarantee our candidates for a year. When I worked for Manpower, we would guarantee our candidates for 30 days. But at Titus, it's a year because we do so much work and we make sure it's a fit, not just for the client, but for the candidate. You know, it's important that it's a fit for all parties. Well, really nice that, you know, you do assessments on both the sides, and um, I think that's really good. I uh, really love the passion that you have. Uh, so can we just uh, get started with the first question, uh, Ben? The first question is going to be about uh, job security. Do you think that the employer or the employee plays a more important role when it comes to job security? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think it really depends how you view the, the question itself, right? Overall, I think the company being successful is, is probably step one, right? Like as you look at who has the most impact and control, um, we all do our individual parts as, employ as employees to, to keep the wheels turning, but our individual contribution is seldom enough to guarantee job stability at a company, right? The company really has to be successful. Um, they have to establish their, their value proposition, their place in the market, find a need, um, take market share and really attack that and make themselves indispensable to their clients, right? Solve their problems in a meaningful way that makes it so they don't wanna walk away from you. So in a lot of ways, I would say the company has the most impact on whether or not their employees have stability. However, 
you can look at it a different way. You know, if, if you look at your individual self, you have significant responsibility to impact your individual um, stability, right? Um, make your, you know, yourself and your skills that valuable so that even if your company makes poor decisions, even if they go out there and for whatever reason, maybe the market is disrupted, maybe they're no longer in a, in a superior place in the market, you are valuable enough that they'll retain you as long as possible and that other companies will seek you out if you are displaced. So what does that mean? It means, you know, finding a passion about something that's going to allow you to work hard and, and be super effective at. It means keeping learning, right? So if you need to go back and, um, you know, get an MBA or get a master's degree or, you know, go in, it doesn't even have to be formal education, right? It could be reading, it could be learning, it could be going out and seeking knowledge to make yourself more effective at what you do. So to answer your question both, um, I think, you know, in the larger scheme of things, the company can always impact the, their employees' stability and their ability to retain people and pay them and survive in the marketplace. Everybody has their individual contribution. Um, but then for yourself, you know, you really have the ability, in my opinion, to continue to make yourself more valuable and be a lifelong learner, so that you always have some control um, when it comes to your own career. Perfectly answered. Thank you, Ben. Uh, let's just move on to the next question, Ben. Let's do it. So uh, my next question is about uh, emotional intelligence. For me, one of the parameters of emotional intelligence is the ability of a person to hold a conversation with a lot of tact in it. So uh, Ben, according to you, what do you think should be done you know, by a person to improve this particular trait? Or maybe more specifically, what are the key ingredients required to develop this particular trait called tact? Yeah, you know, it's, I think this is a really important topic too, by the way, um, you know, for, for me as, as, a, as a leader, right, as somebody who is responsible for other people, I think emotional intelligence is critical because I, I don't think you can truly lead people effectively long-term without having emotional intelligence as far as conversations, right, and how you can develop that type of tact to demonstrate emotional intelligence in a conversation. I think certain things are important I think it's really important to, to listen, right? To actually listen. Like mm -hmm. I'm talking to you right now. And if you're in your head thinking, oh, I'm, this is what I'm going to say next. I, like, are you truly receiving the message? You might be hearing it, right? But I, I think it's critical to listen to a person um, and, and, and not just focus on here's how I'm going to counterpoint or here's how I'm going to add to the conversation. I'm truly going to listen to you hear what you're saying, internalize it, and then do a response. Um, I think so often people are just so quick to be like, oh, let me add value or let me jump in. And I don't know if that really makes for a great conversation. I think right. that makes for two people talking and two people, you know, volleying for, for position. But is it truly understanding the person, truly getting their viewpoint? The other thing that isn't as cut and dry, I think is developing empathy. No, empathy is the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Mm -hmm. And you have an opportunity to do that in every single conversation you ever have because someone is sharing their viewpoint with you. Mm -hmm. And if someone is telling you, oh man, I felt really bad the other day because this happened and you know, it really made me question my ability to do X, Y, and Z. Um, one, like we just talked about, if you're thinking about what you're going to say, are you taking the time to listen? But are you also empathizing with them? Are you thinking, wow, yeah, that must have been tough. That was a tough thing to go through. That must have been challenging. I see how you feel and I understand. Now let me respond with something that hopefully hits home with you. My advice, my perspective, something that makes you feel better because as humans, we should want to be empathetic and make that person feel better. Mm -hmm. So to me, when I talk, you know, when I think about emotional intelligence and how it specifically applies to conversations, those are two big takeaways. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's very important, you know, uh, be able to listen to the other side. And, you know, I, that really forms a large part of uh, being tactful in a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so we have uh, the last question, which is more of a fun question. If you had the ability to time travel, 
Uh, which era would you travel back to in time and why? Yeah. So many things come into my mind. The first thing that comes to my mind is so many eras were so dangerous. Um, you know, I was thinking like, oh man, it'd be cool to go back here. And I was like, oh, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of peril in that era. Mm -hmm. um, so ultimately where I think I would go, one of two things, I would love to go to either New York or Paris um, prior to the automobile. When it was people walking in streets and there was you know, horse and carriage, um, when it was just kind of the, the simplicity and the beauty of the cobblestone streets um, and these two cities, which are two of the world's preeminent most um, visited cities in the world, but what they were like in their infancy of tourism, like when before there was the ability to travel there so easily. Mm -hmm. um, so Paris is like my favorite city in the world. I, I, I love it there. I think it's, I think it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, en I've enjoyed my, my time there, but part of me wonders what it would be like before there was automobiles, before there was motorcycles, and there was just, you know, the river throwing, you know, going through the center of it. Um, I just think it's a beautiful city, and I, I would love to visit in that time. I know that's not, like, a super important moment. Like, I could have been at the signing of the Declaration of the Independence just to feel the tension in the room. You know, I could have been at all these amazing moments in history, but I, I think I would perhaps squander my ability to go anywhere to just take in some beauty and simplicity in one of the most amazing cities in the world. Mm. But you know, one thing is that uh, all these, um, you know, ancient cities, or not even ancient, you know, the uh, cities during, you know, the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, I think a lot of them uh, were really disgusting. You know, they were all smelly and, you know, they, they didn't have a proper uh, sewage system or maybe open sewers. And, you know, they basically really were very, very horrible. So you might want to just, you know, visit uh, without physically, you know, being there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't uh, think about that. I'm going to be honest. I did think, okay, there's a lot of modern niceties that I'd probably find myself craving for immediately. Yeah, also like, you know, fumbling in the dark, you know, you don't have your uh, cell phone and things like that. I was assuming I could at least bring my cell phone with me and it, I, would yeah. I would have it on a full charge. Yeah. Okay, now it's your turn to ask me a question. Yeah. Okay. I, I, so... I, I would really love to know where you would want to go. Like, where would you go if you could travel? The other ones are good, but I'm like, right now I'm currently fixated on the where would you travel? Where would you go? What time period would it be? So I'd be curious. Hmm. I think for me, um, I would probably choose to go back to Tudor England. Tudor England has always fascinated me because I think it is like the major turning point for the whole world. Uh, in the sense that Britain uh, became a uh, colonizer only after the Tudor times, you know, and it was actually a direct result of the policies that uh, uh, Henry VIII and then uh, more uh, later actually what uh, Elizabeth I did uh, with the English crown, you know, uh, uh, encouraged colonization of different uh, places, including uh, America and uh, India. So, I think you know that that is one thing that really fascinates me because I want to understand how people really lived in those times and you know and we, we see you know from uh, historical films and stuff that was pro probably the most uh, uh, difficult to understand of times uh, there were so many complex you know scenarios and plots and uh, uh, religious uh, uh, events and there were so many changes going on in England and subsequently, you know, all through the world. So I would probably pick that era. Uh, but again, as I said, you know, I wouldn't want to be there uh, physically and you know be grossed out by the smell or you know get black plague or something. I probably would want to be in a time capsule, you know, just observing uh, the major events and then coming back safely to <laughs> to uh, modern times, 2020. Not that you know. COVID is making it any easier now, but yeah, that's what I would choose. I got to say, listening to your answer, the one thing that stood out to me is that your answer was inarguably better than mine. I was <laughs> like, that is, that is just a way better answer to that question. Um, 
So thank you, Ben. Uh, I think I really enjoyed uh, our episode together. We had a lot of fun, especially with the third question. Um, hope to see you soon, and uh, I will let you know when this thing is published. Right? Well, hey, man, I appreciate it.